David was living like a prince, literally. He was living alongside his prince brother-in-law with his princess wife. That's literally how David was living up until this point. And now, he's a fugitive on the run that is not even allowed to worship his God in Jerusalem. He has been driven out and cast away from his people. He can't even go home to Bethlehem to see his folks. And this is what David's life is going to be for a long time now, years on end. Sometimes God drives us out of our comfort to make us into the people that he needs us to be. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, we're going to continue our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And for those of you who may, I mean, it's been a while. I know it's been a few weeks since we had a Chaplain's Report, you know, it, Christmas break and everything. So just to kind of reset the stage here and help you remember what happened is Saul and Saul is pursuing David and Jonathan and David are trying to figure out a way to figure out whether or not Saul really does want to kill David or this is a temporary thing. They're trying really hard to come up with something and they come up with this scheme. And it's mostly because David already knows that Saul wants to take his life and he's already tried multiple times. Jonathan doesn't want to believe that his dad is capable of that and he says, no, David, I really don't think so. I've, I've talked him down before. He said that he's not going to pursue you anymore. And so Jonathan's still in doubt. And so David and Jonathan hatch up this scheme to test Saul and his loyalty. And, and Saul fails this test. In fact, he is so angry when they try this that not only is he angry that David does not show up because he was going to use it as an opportunity to kill David, he's so angry that he actually attacks Jonathan. And so this is a pretty clear indication that Saul is too far gone. He has murderous intent towards David. And Jonathan goes out to report this to David and to tell him what has transpired. And that is where our story picks up in 1 Samuel 20, verses 41 through 44. And in verse 41, he starts, When the boy was gone, David got up from the south side and then fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed each other and wept together until David wept immeasurably. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in safety, since we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. So David set out and went his way while Jonathan went into the city. A couple things I wanted to bring up about this episode in, in David's life. Why, why is David crying? I mean, we, we know what just took place here. I just explained it. That he kind of already knew that Saul was trying to kill him and Saul wanted him dead. He's already attempted, he made an attempt on his life multiple times. Tried to kill him with a spear, tried to send men to his house to kill him where his, his wife saved his life by sneaking him out of the house. There's been multiple times at this point where Saul has tried to kill David at some point even with his own hands. So why is Saul crying? Why is David crying? Shouldn't he already know this? I think there's a couple of possible explanations, and I don't know which one is correct. I think that there's one that I think is more probable. But it's possible that it's kind of one of those things that David knew, but this made it real. That maybe somewhere in the back of his head, David was thinking, Saul, the man that I knew when I was a young boy that gave me a chance with the giant who reached out to me and made me part of his family. Now, David probably didn't know this at the time, but even that was a plot on David's life. Even that was trying to ensnare him by using Saul's daughter as bait. But nonetheless, David probably doesn't know that at this point. And so 
there may be a part of David's mind, even if he didn't know it was there, that was really holding out hope, that the old Saul is in there somewhere, that he really is a good man, he's just done something that he shouldn't have and, and fallen uh, into a bad place, but, but maybe there is some goodness left there in him. And if that part of David's soul was there, it is gone now. He knows. He knows that the old Saul that he once knew and loved and treated like a, a father, he's just not there anymore. Any part of the old Saul, at least in David's mind, maybe that died right here, and that's why he's so sad about it, is because he finally realized that the old Saul is not there, and he's never going to have his friend, King Saul, like he used to. That that's just not an option anymore. And that is a sad thing. I mean, you can understand why David would mourn that loss and, and that being, you know, made real that he, that he gave him another chance and even now Saul's just not going to come back the way that he did. He's not going to have the same level of love and affection and in fact he has become an enemy of David and he knows that now. I think this is the more probable explanation. I think he feels Jonathan's pain. I think David knew. Based on the way that this conversation unfolds earlier in this chapter, I think David knows that the old Saul is gone. I think he knows that Saul only sees him as an enemy and wants to see him dead. That there is no reconciliation that is coming. That he's not going to be able to be with his wife the way that he used to. I think David understands that. I really do. But Jonathan didn't. And because of that, he's seeing Jonathan's pain. And because he loves Jonathan so much, he feels that pain. He feels what it's like to have his best friend and his father wanting to kill one another. Because that's what Jonathan's feeling right now. And I think David is feeling that for Jonathan. And he sees how upset it's getting Jonathan. And because of that, it's making him upset. He hates to see his friend in pain. Maybe it's a combination of these two. I don't know. But either way, this is a very traumatic event in David's life, to see somebody that he loved and trusted and believed had shown him great favor now wants to see his life taken from him, if his own, at Saul's own hands, if possible. And maybe that was combined with seeing how much agony his friend is in over learning these new details. Maybe that's it, I don't know. But either way, this is something that has been very difficult for the future King David. But I think it also shows us that Jonathan was a man of his word. You know, at this time, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is good or bad, I'm just saying this is the way that it was then. There was a great deal of reverence for someone's father, especially if that father was a great man. Somebody like a king or a very wealthy man or whatever. There was just a level of respect for a person's father and family heritage that we don't understand as modern 21st century Americans. I mean, we can study about it, but we've never lived in it. But Jonathan and David did. There is a almost unhealthy reverence for a person's father in their culture and at their time. And Jonathan has already given his word. He has given an oath to God that I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect David. And now he has to make good on that oath. Not only is he having to do so against his father's wishes, which would have been a very difficult thing to do in any generation, but especially in this time, at this place, he's also putting his life at risk. Because under the old law of Moses, if you were just the son of some random person and you displeased them and they killed you, there were consequences for that. That was murder. And you would die too. Like There is legal protection against people doing that. There is no legal protection for the king doing that. If Jonathan wanted to kill, or sorry, if Saul wanted to kill Jonathan on the spot the next time he saw him because he has allied himself with David, he could have. And in fact, we just saw in the last passage that he came darn close to doing that. That when he suspected that Jonathan was in league with David, he threw a spear at him. So Jonathan 
by keeping his oath and his covenant with David, he is not only defying his father, he is putting his own life at risk to protect his friend. That is what Jonathan is doing here. And so the level of friendship between these two is just amazing. And it astounds me, and, and it really is the stuff of legends. But sometimes, I think what this illustrates is that God drives us out of comfort on purpose. I don't know that David becomes the king that he does with his humility and his love for people and his appreciation and gratitude to God if he doesn't go through this. This is the start of the long chapter, and I mean that metaphorically, I'm not talking about a literal chapter in the Bible because there's this, this spans several chapters, but this is a start of the long story that takes place with Saul trying to kill David which is a significant amount of the book of 1 Samuel. This is the origin point. What would have happened if David had just been a, a guy that is in good graces with the king and then the king died and instead of leaving it to his son because it was God's will that they just transferred the power over to David because that's, that's what should have happened and that's what Saul should have done when he found out he was no longer the Lord's, Lord's anointed. He should have passed his crown on to David. I mean, maybe that would have been better in some sense, but the truth is that just wasn't going to happen. God made Saul king knowing that this was going to take place. And he anointed David and, and allowed all this to happen knowing that Saul was going to pursue him and try to take his life. David was living like a prince, literally. He was living alongside his prince brother-in-law with his princess wife. That's literally how David was living up until this point. And now, he's a fugitive on the run that is not even allowed to worship his God in Jerusalem. He has been driven out and cast away from his people. He can't even go home to Bethlehem to see his folks. And this is what David's life is going to be for a long time now, years on end. Sometimes God drives us out of our comfort to make us into the people that he needs us to be. And as much as we may not like it, as much as we may fight against it, as much as we may pray that God would not do that to us, sometimes we have to be driven out of our comfort zone in order to become the warriors that God needs in his army. And that's certainly what happens with David over the next few years. He goes from being a, a very valiant young man to being the king that will lead God's people and the greatest king that they will ever see up until David's predecessor, Jesus the Christ. And this is the time that God is going to take to prepare him for that task. And I think God does the same thing to us sometimes too. Sometimes we're comfortable and something comes and just destroys that comfort. But it's because God needs to prepare us for the task that he has us ready to do. And a comfortable life just isn't suited to do that most of the time. I take a great deal of comfort in that. Stay the course, friends. A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.